I dropped my book in the bath. <laughs> This reminds me when I used to iron my money as a kid. Ironing my dollar bills so that they all were freshly straight. The signs were all there. We are getting into books that I read, loved, did not finish, and absolutely hated in June. Just as a reminder, I have a specific scales that I use to rate the actual book overall, as well as how spicy the book is when we're talking about romance novels. I'll remind you of the rating scale that I use. I rate a book on its plot, characters or character development, setting, writing style, pacing, themes, originality, emotional impact, overall enjoyment, and the ending. And I add them all up at the end, and whatever number that is out of 10, that's the rating I'm giving the book. And I also have a new one I made this month because I got into reading psychological thrillers and mysteries, so I created a scary scale. I am a wimp when it comes to scary books, and I don't really know how I even got to this point, but it made me feel something and I felt alive, and I was like, I want more of that. Uh, and then immediately just dove into the deep end with some recommendations, and I regretted it. My brain isn't all right. So this is my scary scale. Level one, adrenaline rush. We're giving that one ghost. It's gonna be suitable for most readers. It's mostly solving like mysteries or puzzles. It's not scary. Like amateur sleuths solving a whodunit in a small town. Level two, a little creepy. <laughs> two ghosts. This is gonna be a book that is not, it's like suspenseful a little bit. It's a little thrilling. There might be like mini jump scares or just like, oh wow. You can read this alone. You can read this before bed. You can read this in the dark. You're not gonna be afraid to get out of the bed and pee. From level two to level three, that is the cutoff right here. This is where you start to question whether you should really get out of bed and go pee or not because you're a little scared. Level three is lights on, sun out. We got three ghosts. It's pretty much what the title says. You cannot really read this book if the sun has gone down or if the lights aren't all the way on in your house. You don't wanna really read this book if you're alone at home because the sound of the wind outside, you're like, I know that's the wind, I know it. But someone could also be breaking into my home right now. This is where like psychological elements start to be kind of introduced into the plot. It's a little unsettling at times. If you were to go to a movie night, you would bring a level three as a scary movie and everyone would be like, awesome, you brought a scary movie. Okay, level four, I think we should check on the emotional well-being of the author. Doing it four ghosts. This is where you start to wonder how a person can write the things that they've written and be okay. You're like, I know it's fiction. I know that, but where did this come from within you? High suspense, high tension, a lot of frightening scenes, lots of jump scares, graphic, disturbing content. If someone walked up to you and was like, hey, what are you reading? And you feel like you're embarrassed to explain the plot because they'll never see you the same, that's a four. Level five, nightmare fuel. This is horror. This is gore. Deeply unsettling. You should not be reading it. Nobody should. Nobody should be writing or reading it, but here we are. This is a level that even lovers of thrillers are like, constant, intense fear. Feel a little sick to your stomach. The author is not okay, you're not okay. Feel like maybe you should burn the book after you read it because having it in your house is like, I don't know if I really want that. Probably read it and then burn it for, for safety. That's a level five and that's the scary scale. I hope that's helpful. All right, let's just get into it. We're gonna start with romance because my armpit just farted. Number one, Funny Story by Emily Henry. Overall rating, nine out of 10. On the spicy scale, 3.5. This was everything I have ever wanted out of an Emily Henry book. This was what I hoped all of the other Emily Henry books that I read before were. I love it so much. It was my first read of June and it was quite literally the perfect way to kick this month off. Character development, her witty banter back and forth, all of it, it's, it's beautiful. This story is just like, oh, it's, it's amazing. Oh, the story, the main characters. I wanted to be there. It was like, oh, I loved it. I took a half a point off on the ending. Ending just fell a little flat for me. That's it. I'm obsessed. I loved it. <sighs> Excuse me. Up next, the do-over by, sorry, by Lynn Painter. 8.5 out of 10. I love Lynn Painter so much. Just a solid young adult, easy read, super sweet. It's like a level one spice. It's just kisses. It's not like, I mean, they're like high schoolers. So please, 
please don't give me more than just kisses. I read this book because I loved her book uh, better than the movies so much, but the premise is basically that Emily Hornby gets stuck on Valentine's Day and is reliving the same day over and over and over and over again. It's really sweet. It gets obviously like a little bit, I mean the pacing, because it's the same day over and over again. The emotional depth in this book, unexpectedly incredible. Very unexpected though. Lynn Painter, captures what it's like to be a daughter of a divorced parents. <laughs> like, wow, that's it. That's how it is. The themes that she discusses in terms of like Emily Hornby relating to her father compared to relating to her mother and what it's like to have a stepmom, all of that, it's just really beautifully written. And it gave this book a, a fullness that you just don't expect when you're like picking up a young adult novel to just read for fun. Again, because it's set in Omaha, another strength. I could picture every single place they were going. Old Market, Spaghetti Factory, all of it. I'm like, Yes, that is exactly where I just was yesterday. It's so good. I took a half a point off for the plot because I don't like the time loop Groundhog's Day kind of idea, but I didn't take a full point because that's preference more than anything. I also took a half a point off for characters because I knew so much about the two main characters, but the side characters, I'm like, give me more. Like these people could be so dynamic. The groundwork is set. Just give me more depth now. Absolutely recommend, really sweet love story, 8.5 out of 10. It happened one summer, Tessa Bailey. I shouldn't really have that many thoughts about this book, but I do, I really do. I, we're gonna get into it. Six out of 10. I'd say the spice level is closer to a four. Now, every once in a while, not every once in a while, it's actually pretty common in the, in the romantic novel world where you pick up a book and you can tell the sex scenes were like basically written first. And then someone's like, I should turn this into a whole book. And so they do. That's how I felt about this book. It just felt like the whole story existed to support the sex happening between the two main characters in this book. And that is not my story, but there was just a high frequent volume of Spice that was very like, what is happening? The trope is like enemies to lovers, fish out of water. He's a fisherman. There's a lighthouse. That's the vibe. I have a big issue with the sex scenes. I do not love when you are reading a book and the main character is one way and then the spice happens and out of left field, full 180 degrees, they start saying things and you're like, excuse me, where did that come from? Like, it's jarring, I don't know. There's a fine line though, between revealing new parts of this person that you've been getting to know and then just them being a completely different person in the bedroom. That's weird and a little jarring. It just was jarring. That's the best way I can describe it. The setting and the ending were the only two areas I gave a full point. I feel like if I went through all of them, it would just be like, why are you harping so much on this? I'll just let it go. So I'm not gonna do that. All I'm saying is this wasn't really for me, wouldn't <clears> recommend, don't be, I'm not like, like, hey, if someone recommends it to you, punch him square in the face. That's not how I feel about this book. Very spicy, if that's what you're looking for, so. Okay, so those were the standalone romantic novels that I read. Now we're gonna get into the series. And I'm so excited. Allie Hazelwood. I have goosebumps. I don't technically know if all three of these are in the same series. I don't think that they are, but we're gonna be talking about Allie Hazelwood books. I found her on accident by reading love theoretically. I consumed this book like it was oxygen and I had none. Just <laughs> like, let me, I can't breathe, let me get it into my lungs. Right into my lungs. <sighs> so anyways, that's, <laughs> that's how I got into her. Turns out I don't actually love everything she writes, which is totally fine. I don't expect to love every single book an author writes, but it was clear her writing style and her skill as a writer just improved with every single book she wrote. And to the point where when I got to her, I was reading Love Theoretically, which is like one of the newer-ish books that she had written. So then when I tried to go backwards, I wasn't as impressed the further I went back. All that to say, obsessed with Allie Hazelwood and the way that she writes and the themes that she inputs into her books. She loves to write women that are clearly on the spectrum in some way. And I'm like, give that to me. Yes, I want that and I need that. Now I will say her spice is spicy, but very slow burn. By the time you get to it, especially if you're reading for the autistic representation or the asexual representation, it's like, yeah, no, it makes sense for me to read this whole thing. This was the book that got me into reading more autistic female-led romance novels. Changed my life forever. I'm not joking. Let me put these here and we'll talk about love theoretically. 
This book had no business changing my life the way that it did. I'm being serious. This is a 9.5 out of 10 for me. The level of spice I'd put is a 3.5. Again, it's a slow burn, very late into the book. It's about Elsie Hannaway. She is a theoretical physicist. Her arch rival nemesis happens to be the brother of this guy that she was dating. Elsie is never like outright described as being on the spectrum, but it's very clear with the way that she thinks and talks and perceives herself and masks. She is an autistic woman in some way, shape or form. And it's amazing. And I had no clue how deeply I craved that representation of my own self in a book like this until I read it. And it was like, this is life changing for me. I'm gonna read you a couple like excerpts. It's not gonna spoil it at all, but it was like the yes moment for me where I realized, oh wow, this is not gonna be just a book for me. This is gonna be something that I use to identify myself and understand myself and the way that I relate to other people for the rest of my life. This is page seven, ready? This is her talking about herself. Unremarkable Elsie Hannaway of the medium everything, and yet my medium mediumness is the perfect blank slate to fill, an empty canvas to paint on, a mirror reflecting only what others care to project. Page 12, I find that people like me better if they don't have to expend emotional energy on me. And then the last one I'm gonna do. I'm a pro at picking up cues, but Jack, he gives me nothing. I don't know what to amp up, what to tone down, what to hide and what to fake, what personality to sacrifice at his altar. Okay, okay. This is gonna be a good book and I am gonna cry. So that's how I feel about this book. Just so close to a perfect score. The only points I took off were half a point uh, for setting. We could have done more with the setting, half a point off for that. But other than that, it was nearly a perfect score for me. There's some weaknesses. We're gonna talk about them really quick. The covers. I'm not gonna lie to you. I almost ripped the covers off it, because I know that sounds mean. I don't like when a book shows me what the characters should look like. Not in a real way, vague way, that's fine. This just felt so specifically descriptive of what these people should look like and what I should be picturing when I'm reading that it really took a lot of imagination away from me and those choices that my brain would make for me when I'm reading. And I don't think this woman right here is medium mediumness in any way. She's a gorgeous, clearly, I don't know, I can just see the sight of her, but she's beautiful to me. So is he, it's, it's great, they're beautiful. The cover almost did a disservice to me for the whole book. This one wasn't as bad. I had to really not look at him. I was just like, I don't see it. And then there were just, there is some moments of cliche, absolutely am fine ignoring, like reading it through my, I don't see it. I'm pretending I don't see it. This book is too good. It's too good. I refuse to see it. I just am gonna look past it. I accept that about myself. It's fine. Absolutely would recommend. Staying in the Allie Hazelwood universe, The Love Hypothesis, which is book number one in the series. I suddenly became aware of my shoes and I'm taking them off. <laughs> All of a sudden my feet were like, oh my God, you're actually, I don't think you can breathe. I've had them on for hours. I've had no problems. Okay, the love hypothesis. A little less spicy, I think, than love theoretically. Still like a 3.25. The trope is fake relationship, kind of enemies to lovers, but really just like fake relationship. I have mixed feelings about this book. I rated it a 6.5 out of 10. Now I know what you're thinking. She hated it. I didn't hate it. I read them backwards on accident. So compared to the first book that I read, this fell so short. Unfortunately, the main premise is Olive. She's like a PhD student. Dr. Adam Carlson, who is a physicist and is like one of the professors that kind of is responsible for growing these PhD students like in a garden. <laughs> There's the PhD garden. Fully right. Send him off. No, but he is one of like the main professors and everybody hates him. Olive wants to convince her best friend, Anne, that she's over her ex. Anne wants to date her ex. So Olive just like picks a random person and is like, yeah, you're it. I'm gonna kiss you right now in front of Anne. I'm not giving anything away. That's literally on the blurb in the back. That's just how the book starts. Problem I have with this book is the longer I sat with the plot, it doesn't make any sense. Not even a little bit. It's not the fake relationship that doesn't make sense. It's not even that Anne wants to date her ex, which if my best friend tried to even go on a date with somebody, I was like, talking to. I'd be like, what are you doing? What is happening here? But anyways, it's not even that. The dynamic of her being a student and him being a professor, like, what are you getting out of this? Usually like a fake dating relationship, it benefits both parties. The benefit for him didn't make any sense compared to what she would be getting out of it. 
So it's just like, I didn't like his character. I don't know. If I would have read this first, I don't think I would have been so hard on it. The second book, The Love Theoretically, was so good. Would I still read it again? Yeah, absolutely. Would I say you should read it? Yes, especially if you're gonna read the whole series. It wasn't, oh, it wasn't as good. So that's why I'm just being hard on it. And then the next, Not In Love, still by Allie Hazelwood. <laughs> Overall, I rated this a seven out of 10. Of all of her books, she clearly states, this is an erotic novel. I did not expect that. <laughs> like an author note at the beginning, like, hey guys, I know you're used to more like rom-com type vibes for me. This is not that. This is more than that. A lot more than that. It's erotic. So I wasn't prepared for that, that's fine. The trope is like a forbidden love, enemies to lovers, friends with benefits. Oh, my camera's gonna die. Okay, sorry, we're back. Content warning on this book. There are some really, really heavy topics in this book. Food insecurity, grief, child neglect. She really handles these topics with care. It adds a very unexpected layer of depth to this book. I took a whole point off for characters. There was so much spice, I felt like it kind of took away from getting to know the characters as people. I only really learned deeply about them when they were relating to each other. Sometimes that can just feel a little one dimensional. Rue really, like her emotional maturity was pretty low, but every once in a while, I just got this desire for her to know herself better because she was such a strong character sexually. Like it's easier to relate to people sexually versus emotionally. Like that's obviously an undertone of the book, but I craved for her to understand herself better because Eli knows himself so well that I was like, why doesn't she get that? I did take a half a point off for the writing style because this was the first book that Ali wrote where Rue was first person and Eli was third person. I just didn't understand that. I wanted his to be first person. And then I took a whole point off for pacing. So overall seven out of 10. Would I recommend this? Maybe if you're looking for an erotic novel. If that's your vibe, hell yeah, absolutely. If that's not your vibe, I would skip it. That is it for Ali Hazelwood. Ali, I cannot wait to write, read, no. I can't wait to read what you write in the future. I think I need a coffee. Love theoretically was life-changing. I marked that book up as if it was a self-help book. The Kiss Quotient series by Helen Huang. This was my own personal textbook. It answered questions about myself I didn't even know I had. This is a four on the spicy scale, 10 out of 10, no notes. Let me just tell you the moment I finished reading this book, I started it over and read it again. I read this book twice, back to back. That is how much I loved this book. The premise of this book is like Pretty Woman, but the opposite way. She is hiring a male escort, basically to teach her how to have like relationships with people and have a boyfriend. Stella, she's autistic. It's an alternating point of view between Stella and Michael. I did not want this book to end so much that I just kept reading the author's note at the end. Like the acknowledgements. I'm like, I don't know, just give me anything. And I was crying at the author's note. Every word between the cover and the back cover of this book. I want it to be tattooed on my soul, memorized and folded into my the cells of my brain. I wanna close my eyes and be able to read this book from memory. I decided to mark everywhere that I related to the main character, Stella. <laughs> You need it in your life. And the crazy thing is, I don't like spice and I usually skip the spice. Like I've said it before, I just picture the author sitting and writing it. So I skip most of it. I didn't do that with this. And I'm trying to not cry. The importance that this book holds in my life is hard to explain and put into words. Like the way that they so matter of factly talk about being intimate, just of the way that she works and her personality. I'm like, yes, give me no emotion, all facts and figures and data and graphs. I love that. <laughs> Yeah, very powerful book. I'm pretty sensitive to pacing and even the pacing of this book was perfect. Yes. Okay, moving on to the second book in the series, The Bride Test. This was my first do not finish. And I'm gonna tell you why. The premise of this is that there's a guy named Kai and he is autistic in this book. Kai's grandmother basically gets to this point where she's like, I'm so tired of you not being married. So she goes to Vietnam, runs this like dating ring kind of thing where she just tries to like interview a bunch of women and she's secretly trying to find his wife. And he doesn't know this is happening. And her goal is to find one of these women, pay her, send her to the United States and trick 
Kai basically into falling in love with this girl and then marrying him without knowing that like the grandmother set this all up and it was like arranged. I don't love that. I don't love the idea that Kai is going to be tricked. The thing I loved about the kiss quotient was Stella, she was in control of her relationship with Michael, the terms of their relationship, the speed at which their relationship went, 100% autonomy over their interactions. I appreciated that she felt like she was going at a pace that she was comfortable with. With this, the idea that like an autistic male lead is being tricked into falling in love. The further I got into the story, the more it just made me uncomfortable. So I didn't finish this. I'm not gonna rate it. So then I read the third book in the series, The Heart Principle. I did read this all the way. I read it in one day. I was depressed after. I would give this a three uh, peppers on the spicy scale. I rated this a 5.5. If you were not to package this as a romantic novel, I think that rating would be higher. But the problem with this book is, it's like two books in one. It starts as a romantic novel, and then like a quarter of the way through, it takes the hardest of hard lefts into one of the heaviest stories I've read in a long time. And I was not prepared for that at all because of the kiss quotient and how, not light, but like, it was a rom-com. This book is not, it, I don't, I don't know how it has anything to do with the first one. The main themes of this book are like caretaker burnout and autistic burnout, which are very important topics. Helen Huang does an incredible job writing about them. The way that the book starts is so perfect. Like if I could have just had the first quarter of the book the whole time, it would have been up there as the same as like Kiss Quotient. And then when it took that hard left into basically like the main character having all of this like family sh just like dumped on her and her just drowning in it. It was heavy. I had to stop reading this a couple times during that day that I read it. And I didn't have the emotional energy to explain to Jonas what the book was. So the whole day he just kept asking like, are you okay? No, I'm not, I'm not. But the love story happening between Quan and Anna, I want a whole book of just that. Also the um, journey that Anna goes on in terms of diagnosing herself with a therapist as autistic and her trying that diagnosis on, trying it on in conversation with people as well as like revealing it to her family. That was powerful. I wanted more of that. I wanted more of her and Quan. If we could have just gotten that through the whole book, it would have been a 10 out of 10 for me, but it did take a left turn. Of all three books that I read of hers, I would say the one I would recommend to you is The Kiss Quotient. Sorry, I'm actually just taking a second because that's a lot of books. I just need a break for a second. I promised myself last month I was gonna review them after each book and then make like a compilation of it all. And then I just didn't because I was like, why would I do that when I could do it all at once? When I need to remind myself, I'm just gonna play this clip of me being overwhelmed. Okay, let's get back to it. King of sin, king of sin, king of sin. Okay, we're back. I had my little enrichment time on the ground with my snack and my coffee to disassociate for like five seconds. We're back now with the King of Sin series. <laughs> me, but how dare you come into my home and do this to me. I did drop this book in the bath. I don't want to talk about it. Each book is based on like one of the seven deadly sins. So this is King of Wrath. And then there's King of Pride, King of Greed, King of Sloth. And then from uh, Goodreads, I can see that there's three pending, which I think are the next three in the series that she's still writing. I will buy all of them. I will read all of them probably multiple times. 10 out of 10. The easiest 10 out of 10 I could possibly give today. 3.5 on the spice scale. Listen, I'm toxic, all right? I've got some issues to work through and this book fed all of those issues in the best way. I am well fed. Could this man get any more toxic? Not really. Do I care? No. Like just hate me and ignore me a little bit. Yes. Just we're gonna move on from that now. Okay, listen. So the main idea is it's like alternating first person point of views between Dante and Vivian. They are put into it like an 
arranged marriage. He is a billionaire. She is like an heiress of this jewelry business of her family. It's like new money versus old money shoved into an arranged marriage together. Wow, Dante, brooding, angry, difficult, asshole, before meeting my incredible husband. That was just my type. So these stories give me a sense of control over things I absolutely could not control in my previous life. Vivian is strong, doesn't put up with his shit. That's why I don't have an issue with this book. If Dante walked all over Vivian and she was like just this like doormat to him, like no, I don't really love that. But she is a strong female character and she is this like confident woman with him who just is like, no, get out of here with that. And just like matches his level of assholeness. And I really appreciate that. This book gives me like 50 shades of gray vibes, but not as many shades, like maybe 15, the vibe of it, not the the plot of it. It's like the author of Fifty Shades of Grey read this book first and was like, I love it. Let's amp it up so much and add props. That's what I imagine happened with this book. It is quite literally everything I needed when I started the book and I had no idea. I wouldn't stop shutting up about this book. Jonas and I had many conversations about this book. He read this book with me. I would like read it out loud. It's a good one. It's a good one. <laughs> 10 out of 10. All right, moving on to uh, mystery and thrillers. That whole world of what is happening, and I'm a little scared. Or a lot scared if you accidentally dove in with the books that I did. We're gonna start with Verity by Colleen Hoover. I rated this a seven out of 10. I think it's a romantic thriller. I didn't know that. It's spicy. That's a spicy meatball. I, I wanted like a, a psychological thriller. I didn't know there was spice in this when I picked it up. That's what I get for having a random comment on YouTube be like, you should read this. And I'm like, yeah, I absolutely should. I don't need any more information than that. And then I buy it. It's also a four on the scary scale. I would like to remind you that a four on the scary scale is called, I think we should check on the author. Because how did that come out of your brain? And are you okay? And would you like to talk? The general premise of this book is Lowen. She's an author and she gets hired to finish this series that this very famous author, Verity, was writing and then suddenly she just like can't finish the series. So Lowen has to come in and basically write as if she is Verity and finish the series for her. In the process of doing that and trying to get into the headspace of Verity, she just finds out a lot of weird shit that's real dark and not okay and dark and not okay. It's a lot. The book itself was very good. It was disturbing and I hated it a lot. That does not equal a bad book. That means that was a bad pick for me. But the actual book itself, wow. The intended response was definitely solicited out of me for this book. This was the first jump scare I have ever gotten from a book. I didn't actually even know that was possible, to be fully honest with you. How do you have a jump scare when you're reading it? It's possible. I'm gonna tell you right now, it's possible. Another strength of this book is the setting. Colleen Hoover does an incredible job to the point where like sometimes when I think back to this book, I forget I haven't seen this place and it's just so vivid in her description of setting. It is so creepy. That's, it's powerful. Great writing. It's so spicy. I don't know what I was expecting, but it wasn't that. The only other like thrillers I had read before this were not spicy. So I forgot you could like mix genres. No, it's either romance or it's thriller. There's no way that there could be both at one. How is that even possible? How would you even do that? It's not even possible. One of the weaknesses is the characters. Lowen was so unforgettable that I genuinely forgot her name multiple times. I don't know if that was intentional, but either way, it didn't translate into a positive for me. I know so much about what you were supposed to do for this book, but I don't know who you are. I wanted more from her character development. I did take a whole point off for overall enjoyment because I hated it. It was a great book and I hated it very much. And then I took a whole point off for the ending. I can't really say much more than that, but I wanted to throw this book against a wall because really, it's not the ending. It's how, it's how the ending. When a professor is like, I get that you got that answer, but show your work. And the work is all wrong, but the answer's right. And you're like, how did we get there? That's as much as I can say. But overall, it was a good book. It was very well written. I just hated it so much. <laughs> Next up, the Housemaid series by Frida McFadden. I say the series, but I only read the first one. I bought all the other ones there on my bookshelf to read this month, but I only made it through the first one. And I really needed a break from this series after I read it. I felt kind of sick to my stomach while reading it. I don't know why I jumped in with these books. I am a wimp. I read behind her eyes and I just asked a bunch of people for like books that were like that. I got a bunch of recommendations and I did not think to do any work 
uh, in terms of Googling what they were and how scary they were, I was like, yeah, that's my next book. No further questions. I would have liked to have asked a few more questions with this one. Okay, we're back, sorry. I really enjoyed this book so much. By the time it was too scary for me to really like, by the, I'm scared myself talking about these books. By the time this book got way too scary for me to really sleep at night, it I was too far in. Uh, two on the spicy scale, uh, it was closed door scenes. And then the scary scale, 3.5. No jump scares. There was some gore. Like it was a little, like there was some blood at some point where I was like, wow but mostly it was just psychologically disturbing. Again, I have to question like, Frida, how are we doing? I just don't think I like the disturbing like darkness. It's, it, it really like haunts me. There's a little bit of like torture aspects, like all of that. It's like, but the book is really good. I rated this a 9.25 out of 10, which is shocking to me. I did enjoy it that much, but it's so dark. Like it's not a book that I could willingly just like gift and be like, yeah, you're gonna love it. If that's your vibe, absolutely I would recommend it. But you have really got to know what you're reading when you get into this book. There has to be a few questions before you give this book to somebody of like, you like psychological thrillers? Awesome. How psychological? How dark? What's your threshold? It's like a half a point off for overall enjoyment because again, it did get a little dark and gory to where I had to skip a, a bit. And then I took a half a point off for the ending. The actual ending was amazing. The way all of it was wrapped up, the plot holes are, there aren't holes, they're continents. They're just gaping. You have to really suspend your disbelief. But the ending ending made me buy the rest of the series. One of the biggest strengths of this book is the character development. I don't know if I have ever been so drawn in to the characters of a book. Oh my god, she's such an incredible author. It was so well written that I just was like, I, I have to keep reading more of this. And the pacing in this book, chef's kiss. Okay, and then the last thriller that we're going to talk about today is The Silent Patient by Alex by Alex. Michael Lides. This book got a seven out of 10 for me. It's a two on the spice scale. My neighbors were walking by and just watched me. And a three on the scary scale. Okay, now you have to, I'm holding the book up to the camera, I know. The cover is very scary. I almost didn't read it because the cover looked so scary to me. I wanted to kind of rip the cover off because it really deterred me. It actually isn't as scary as the cover makes it look. The general idea, Alicia was convicted uh, for murdering her husband. And after that happened, she just never spoke again. And everyone is like, this is suspicious and we want to know why this is happening. And this whole book is narrated from the perspective of this guy named Theo, who is a forensic psychologist, I believe. He just, he wants to know how this all came to be. The author actually says in the back of the book that a lot of his inspiration was Agatha Christie. Totally, that is definitely the vibe. It's like a scarier Agatha Christie. So if you like Agatha Christie, I think you would really like this book. There are so many characters that oftentimes it's really, really hard to get a good sense of all of them because if you have so many, you just kind of lose track. That does, did not happen in this book. I cared so much about every single character. And then he gives a list of books that he's like, if you really liked this book of mine, here are some books that you should read that I didn't write. Books that inspired him as he was writing it. I just think that's so badass. It's like a Q&A with the author about the book. It's like the story begins with blah, 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 blah. Where, why did you decide to start the book this way? Questions that you might have about the book that the author immediately answers for you personally. I think that's a really cool touch. I really liked the Q&A. And then at the end, it says the five best plot twists in fiction and then gives five books that you should read if you like this book. And this is how I got into Agatha Christie. The ending of this book was kind of subpar for me, to be fully honest with you, but that really resurrected the book for me. I actually took a whole point off for the ending. Yeah, really, really interesting. So seven out of 10, I would recommend this book. It's not really that scary, more just mind bendy. And then speaking of Agatha Christie, We've got two Agatha Christie books. These are not obviously like psychological like the other ones are. These are more like murder mystery, erring on the side of the scary scale where you're still free to get out of bed and go pee because you're not too scared to do that. So part of my brain like really wanted to make me believe that I only wanted to read books that were like spice and I wanted to challenge myself by reading classics. How far could I expand my preferences? I started with Five Little Pigs. 
I rated this a nine out of 10. This was everything I would have assumed a murder mystery Agatha Christie book would be. The scary scale, I'd put it at like a two. It's like a 1.5. It genuinely is more of like a whodunit. It's not scary you, it, at all. This detective gathering information as per the request of um, this woman's daughter who like this woman was tried for the murder of her husband 20 something years past and the daughter wants to go get married and finds this detective and says, my mother did not kill her husband. And I know for a fact my mother is innocent. The whole premise of this book is essentially this French detective going and collecting testimonials from all these people and then putting together what he thinks actually happened. It's genius. The funny thing is, I thought it was so boring until I was shocked by how interested I was in it. It was a pride read. Like I was like, I started it and I'm not gonna let anyone tell me I can't finish this because if I can't finish this, I don't deserve books. That was like where my mind was at. Is that healthy? No, it's not. And if anyone told me that's how they felt about reading a book, I'd be like, just stop reading the book. It's not that important. But I was really proud and wanted to get through it to prove to myself that I could get through a classic and and not even enjoy it, but just understand it. Because the writing is just so different and worded just so beautifully and so not of this time. The beginning was really hard for me to get into. And then all of the sudden, once I realized what the format of the book would be, I suddenly was like, oh my God, I actually love this so much. And I'm so glad I pressed forward and kept reading it because I was really surprised by how much I loved it. I took a a half a point off for themes. Really, it's just a murder mystery. And then I did take a half a point off for the ending, but the whole process of the book is so fascinating. Nine out of 10, absolutely would recommend. Love that so much. Let's read, and then there were none. Nine out of 10, for different reasons than the other one. The premise of this, okay, first of all, this is scary. <laughs> I wasn't ready for how scary this was because this one was like a 1.5. This, I'd say this is a 2.5. It's past the threshold of not wanting to like read this alone. I stopped reading the physical copy halfway through and started listening to it on Audible. It made me so nervous and jumpy. I couldn't read it alone at my office. So I was like, maybe if I listen to it in the car, it'll make it less scary. And it didn't, <laughs> it actually made it worse. Those Audible like voice actors when reading these classics go all out. This is actually worse. This is scarier because your voice is so scary. <laughs> the idea is 10 people are invited to this like private island by this random stranger who writes him a letter. And the thing that makes it so creepy is, and then there were none, is a nursery rhyme. It's creepy and it's so good. It's just, it's like, I was just kind of was panicked the whole time. Very strong, but because it was so well written and it was about the mystery of the story, it was just good. It was, and by the end of it, I was like, oh my God, like I'm not gonna be able to sleep tonight. I did take a half a point off for pacing and then I took a half a point off for the themes. That's just the nature of this book, I think. Nine out of 10, both nine out of 10, absolutely recommend. I wanna read more Agatha Christie. So if you have any recommendations, please, please, please uh, put them in the comments. The Inheritance Games by Jennifer Lynn Barnes. First of all, can we just talk about how beautiful this cover is? This is such a beautiful cover. I mean, it's giving Great Gatsby luxury mystery billionaire. And that color green is so pretty. I rated this a 6.5 out of 10. Now, that does not mean I didn't love the book and I would absolutely recommend you read it. But the premise of this book is Avery is a random high school girl. This man in the middle of Texas leaves billions of dollars after he dies to her. Never met him in her life, has no idea who this person is. This dude has a huge family, like all the grandkids, all the kids, this giant estate and all the estates around the world, like billionaire, billions of dollars, everything to her. The whole book is to try and figure out why. Chef's kiss, I love that plot so much. Hello. I just have my windows open because it's raining today and so everyone just keeps staring in because I have a big light. This was a great casual read and it has so many strengths, but here are the points I had to take off. Number one, the writing style. It's like a young adult series. A lot of the language is super cliche. I wanted it to be a little bit more complex than it was. I also took a point off, a half a point off on themes. But actually now that I'm thinking about that, it did. It offered themes of like family dynamics, betrayal, letting people down, losing a child. Like there was actually a lot more, it, it was deeper than I, I think I gave it credit for when I originally wrote that. We're gonna change that. It's bumped up to a seven out of 10. Originality, yes. The pacing of this book, 
great. It never stopped. The strongest point of this book is just the puzzles. How Jennifer Lynn Barnes, where are you coming up with these puzzles? How are you keeping all of these straight? The Hawthorne house, place where this whole book basically takes place. That's a puzzle in itself. The house is a character all in itself. I'm obsessed. I would get the blueprints of this house and hang them in my office because it was so fascinating. I'm just gonna close these blinds. It's not really letting that much light in anyways. It's basically a thunderstorm out there. The problem I have with this book is it's not one you can lose yourself in. You have to think so hard about what's happening and keep things straight that like, this isn't a book you would take on a plane with you. You start your ascent into the air and then you blink and all of a sudden you're at your destination and your the book is half done. It just, it was, my brain couldn't lose itself in the story. It took me so much time to think about what was going on to picture it. Biggest problem I have with this book is the ending. I know that the ending was written so that you would want to keep going and like read the other books in the series. But I am a firm believer that it, even though a book is in a series, you should be able to walk away from that book and feel complete and whole. Cliffhangers are fine, but a cliffhanger shouldn't come at the expense of the work done in the book individually. I just think that the ending should have been a little bit more final. I needed more. I needed more resolution. But either way, we've we've bumped it up. Seven out of ten, which I think is actually a very fair rating of this book. Uh, I will read the second and the third book this upcoming month in July and kind of include that in my next review. So there you go. Wow, that was a lot. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, please let me know in the comments below if you have any suggestions. I will take any and all of them. I am so obsessed and I just, I'm having so much fun reading and finding community of people on YouTube. So yeah, I'll take all your suggestions. Uh, it's really fun to be able to share all that with you guys. So anyways, okay. I'll see you next month for July's roundup. Bye. <laughs> My annotation process is all over the place. And I know that people have asked like, how are you annotating your books? Cause you have so many freaking little markers in there. Each book is completely different. Some books I'm marking because they're inspiring to me as, an, as a writer. I wanna remember the moment I was inspired by this author. Other times I'm marking a book up because they're personal revelations for me. And there's a lot of overlap between those. I've tried to like color code it. Oftentimes those are exactly the same thing. Those are really the only two times I'm, I'm really marking a book up. And then the I write in the books as like almost journal prompts, to be fully honest with you. These books end up being like journal prompts for my own personal thought life. But the one way that I annotate that is the same in every book, and I can tell just from looking at the book on the outside without opening it, whenever I guess the ending of a book, I annotate it on the top and I'll write the guessing of the ending and then I'll see kind of when I got it right. My goal is to find, to get like little red stickies like this and then to go back and mark as soon as I guessed the ending correctly so that even if I guessed it like 10 times, I'll see exactly which one was the time I guessed it. Cause I want to know how good I, I am at at guessing the endings of like thrillers especially. So that's kind of my annotating system. Mostly it's just helped my own personal life because a lot of these books impact me in a really personal way. And I want to remember those revelations and I want them to live in the book themselves. I don't want a separate journal. The book just kind of comes to life and it's unique to you because it's like become your own reactions and thoughts and feelings to this book. I ruin books. I'm not somebody that's keeping books in perfect mint condition. Like I said, dropped some books in the bathtub, gotten them out, putting a hairdryer on them and ironed them. <laughs> they look like something that I have thoroughly enjoyed and I love that. Anyways. <laughs>